In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And this is the confidence we have in God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of Him. We get a fair amount of visitors and newcomers to our parish, which is a great blessing. But last week, I got a call that I knew was a drive-by. My cell rang on Saturday at 4 p.m. Can we see the church? They asked. Not a hello, not a how are you. No relationship with me apparently desired. I said my name, asked for their name, and invited this young couple to come to worship the very next day. Now that's okay, thanks anyway. So no relationship perhaps with the church desired. That Monday I looked up the person on Facebook and saw that they had some very nice selfies in front of our church for everyone to see. So what were they looking for with the church? Uh, was it Armenian pride? Was it using the church to make their relationships seem more legitimate? Did they just want to show their family that they were near a church, although not inside it? I don't know, but I felt the way I felt when people sometimes call asking for help from the church, who can't come to the church when I invite them, and sometimes they can't even remember which church they called. It's easy for me to be very judgmental about people who are using God and His church for their own selfish purposes, and it's of course wrong. But the uncomfortable truth is that when it comes to my relationship with God, I'm a lot more like the selfie Christians and the dial-up Christians than I would like to admit. Many times I approach God in prayer just like them, not having the time to be with God, to listen to Him and discern how He's speaking in my life, I just want to do a drive-by myself, settle for a quick prayer and the leftovers of a busy day just so I can feel close to God, like taking a selfie with Him in the background. So many times I have no time for hi or hello, I just abruptly come to God to get something. God help me now. Please give me what I need help me out of this mess. Now this is a fairly immature way to pray, yet I think we all approach God in this way at least some of the time. It's like the story of the seven-year-old who announced to his parents, I'm going to bed now, but first I'll say my prayers. And as he went upstairs to his room, he turned to his parents and asked, does anybody need anything? The boy had learned to pray as we all do as beginners more concerned with our needs than our relationship with God. And this isn't all bad. Our reading today actually tells us that God does provide us with everything we truly need, so indeed we should bring our needs to Him in prayer. But God's not an ATM, and of course He's not a lottery ticket. As we mature in faith, we no longer try to use God for what we want, but simply seek Him for who He is. So that's the first question I have for us all to ask ourselves today. In our prayer, is our focus more on what we need or who God is? And like any relationship, let's get to know God before we ask so much from Him. And that's why, actually, there's one condition attached to God's promise to hear our prayers in the reading that I just read you. John writes, if we ask anything according to God's will, that's the condition, He hears us. And so the condition is that if and only if we align ourselves with God's will, our prayer will be heard. And so in his book on prayer, Philip Yancey puts it this way, that most of the struggle in the Christian life and prayer circles around the same two themes. Why doesn't, why doesn't God act the way we want God to? And why don't I act the way God wants me to? And he says that prayer is, prayer is the precise point where these themes converge. So if we persist in prayer, 
we'll come more and more to trust that God knows what we need better than even we do. We even spell this out daily in a beautiful prayer from the Armenian Church evening service that you may have heard. For you, Lord of all, know our needs and desires much better than we could ask or even comprehend. That's why the first step in prayer shouldn't be asking. It probably shouldn't be many words at all. They asked Mother Teresa what she said in prayer, and she answered, I don't say anything, I listen. And mature prayer contains a lot of quiet waiting on God. The words aren't so important as the presence, the time and the will to be with him. And this isn't as easy as it sounds. For me, it takes me a good 15 minutes in prayer to quiet down. It takes me a good 30 minutes in Balarak just to rid myself of all of the voices distracting me from God's. So prayer in conclusion then is to be like any good relationship, it has to be a two-way street. We'd most often like it to be one way, that our part is asking and God's part is answering, but that's more a transaction than a relationship. And prayer is abiding rather than asking. Prayer is communication and communion. And as we know from all our relationships in this world, communication is sometimes miscommunication and sometimes even shouting. But in our relationship with God, as in all love-filled relationships, we must never lose confidence and trust in our love. For as John again assures us, this is the confidence we have in God that if we ask anything according to his name, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have attained the request made of him now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen.